What's up, Weld.com? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, White River Rambo, and this is my own personal critter getter. Now, stress cracks are very common in aluminum boats, and contrary to some people's beliefs that it's not the brand on the side of the boat, it's how you used it, how you abused it, and how much fatigue that metal has seen over the years. And today, we're gonna clean this up and I'm gonna show you the process of how to properly repair a stress crack. If you're a sportsman and you chase critters in an aluminum boat, well, you know what a stress crack is because you've probably had a couple. In today's video, we're going to give you the skills to make sure that you're successful here in the shop. That way, you can be more successful out on the water. All aluminum will fatigue over time. And the highest percentage of where fatigue cracks happen is along a welded process. Generally, the heat affected zone around the weld is where that crack will take place. If it's a high stress area in the boat, then it's highly likelihood of that's where a stress crack is going to take place. In today's video, we're gonna look at my own personal critter getter and look at the hunt deck that I have welded on this 14 foot airboat hole. Now, we've had it set up like this for a couple of years. This fall, I went out and got me a brand new Yammer Hammer. Love this setup, it's been perfect in the shallows, but over the last few months, right here along the edge of the hunt pod where I've welded it to the original transom, I've got a stress crack. So in preparation, we're getting ready to clean off the affected area. Ideally, I want about two inches around the crack in all directions to be able to clean it up properly. That's gonna give me plenty of room to, to wipe off contaminants. Um, and I want, you know, about three to four inches of bare metal kind of all the way around what I'm welding on. That way I can see what the metal's doing that might not be visible with paint on. So to begin with, uh, Benchmark's Abrasives has supplied us with some, uh, some wire wheels as well as uh, I've got die grinders um, and even mini flat disc. No matter what you're using to remove the paint, don't forget ear protection, hand protection, as well as eye protection. Okay, boys and girls, you can see that we've got our affected area cleaned off and it's it's not real easy to see, no matter what camera angle, but our interior of the boat, our battery box comes down right here and then goes across. And right there is the tip of, of one crack, okay? And then it goes up to about here in a, in a little L shape. And then right here on the edge of our pod, which was actually the one I seen. I didn't know that I had this until I, until I started cleaning off paint, but um, right about here and then up and then right around the corner, just barely making the corner um, is, our, is our crack here. So we actually have two cracks. They run like that. Now you can see I've done a little die grinding. I got my, my weld cleaned up and you know there's no porosity in there everything looked really well as far as that goes um, but on the inside of the boat there is a little a little blistering not really affects the weld much i'm not thinking that this is going to be very much stress ideally i would have lined the pod up and that inner compartment in line with one another having them two inches apart here inch and a half or so apart that's, that's what's creating the uh, excessive fatigue in this area. To stop our cracks, our next step is to get a drill bit and to drill out the ends of our cracks. Now, I don't want to drill right where I can see. I probably want to go another three-eighths to half an inch out in front of that crack and, and drill that hole. 
um, because there's probably crack that I can't physically see. And then I'm gonna do a little bit more gouging with either a, a, a carbide cutter is probably best, but given, given this um, being really difficult to get to here, and then on the other side, I can, I can get to this one um, pretty easily, but um, I wanna gouge out as much of that crack as possible even though it looks clean, it's, it doesn't have that black look to it, you know, when a crack works back and forth on itself and gets a lot of debris in it, it's probably not. And any debris inside that crack is going to be pulled into our weld, so we want to cut out as much of that as possible. Even if it means cutting all the way through with a saw or something of the nature. The more open that you can get that, the better off you are as far as cleaning goes. And with aluminum, cleaning is 90% of the game, man. So just uh, just keep working it. So as you can see, we've got our material removed and you can physically see where the cracks were now. This area right in here, the hole that we've got there now is about a quarter of an inch. That is a little bit excessive. However, given the nature of you know how hard this was to get to and the ease of use of using that saw, kind of made it a no-brainer for me because instead of fighting, trying to cut that out, I would rather just go ahead and cut it out quickly and take a little bit extra time to fill that void. Now the whole idea behind the process is to remove both sides of the crack. That crack that's working back and forth on one another will actually allow contaminants inside and that edge can hold dust and debris. When you weld that, all that dust and debris comes out and gets stuck in the weld itself, creating porosity, creating weakness in the joint. So by removing both sides of the crack completely, you virtually el eliminate the opportunity for contamination. Now all we gotta do is get it welded up. Okay, Everlast 255 EXT is what we're gonna take up with today. But before I turn it on, before I start making noise, before I ever attempt to weld my project, I'm gonna weld on a scrap piece right here on the table. Now, same base material, same thickness, and the same kind of holes in the same position, in this case being vertical, I'm gonna set it right here on the table and I'm going to go through my machine settings. That way, I can make sure that everything's running perfectly before I weld on my project. If you're new to TIG welding or you're watching this video to learn something, this is one of the biggest tips that I can possibly give you. The more you know about how your machine's running before you attempt an important weld, the better off you're gonna be. When you go over there in your project, you're not gonna be in position like you could be here at a table sitting in a chair. Over on that project, you might be laying on your back with the TIG pedal in between your knees and welding over your head. You might be like I'm gonna be, leaning over the back of this transom with filler in one hand and off camber standing on one foot, trying not to dip my tungsten in the puddle. When all that's happening, the last thing I wanna think about is, is my machine set up properly? By getting a test piece out, setting it up on the table, I don't have to worry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna start on my first safe position here, uh, memory one. Um, and that is one of my AC settings. So you see we're on high frequency start, advanced square wave on the pedal. I'm not using pulse. I just, I don't use pulse very often. If I do, I use my pedal. Um, for 125 thousandths with a large gap in it, 120 is a little high. So I'm gonna drop down to uh, let's start about 105 and see what that looks like. Um, let's step over to frequency. Frequency, I'm going to be right about the same too. Let's start at, I'll tell you what, let's start at 100, 100. And then on our cleaning, somewhere between 27 and 30 is usually pretty good for me. Um, no down slope, minimal end amps, post flow, six seconds, because I'm right at about 100 amps, that's, that's pretty good. Um, step over pre-flow, half second pre-flow, starting amps. I like to have that about half of, of what my actual amps are. And we should be good to go.
So in the beginning, I've got so much stuff going on this morning. Um, uh, thinking about camera settings and trying to get arc shots and well, I forgot to turn my gas on. So immediately I had to dump a new tungsten. Um, but once we got started, you know, we, we didn't do terrible. Now the consistency is, you know, lacking quite a bit. And if you noticed one of my weak points while I'm trying to weld uphill like this is my arc length and my torch angle. My torch angle needs to be angled up slightly, but I was I was pretty far. And on my arc length, I generally have a longer arc than what I should. And that makes my consistency, you know, a little intolerable for my, <laughs> you know, for what I think it should be when I get done. Um, but all in all, it's clean. The toes are wet. There's plenty of material there. And if we flip it over, we go to our, our other side here. You can see that we've got a nice full seam in the middle. Um, there's not too many low spots and both edges are blistered up, telling us that we're getting penetration all the way up to this oxidation layer. It's disclaimer time. So I'm getting ready to weld on my boat. There's a handful of things that I want to think about before I pick up any tools. One, I'm gonna disconnect the battery. Two, I'm gonna look at the areas in which I am welding and think about what's behind those areas. This is my battery storage area as well as all of the wires, control cables that run my outboard. They are very close to the area in which I'm welding. I wanna think about how much heat that I'm putting into that area and will it affect the wires and things behind that. With a flashlight, I've already pre-approved that there are not any wires touching the metal in which I'm getting ready to weld. Also, think about fuel. If you have an enclosed fuel cell and it is inside a compartment that you're getting ready to weld, make sure that area is ventilated properly. That way you don't blow yourself up. <laughs> so, think about what you're doing, wear your PPE, and let's get started. So let's take a quick look at our couple welds here that we had. Now this was our small weld that was only the saw width and you know two three sixteenths holes at either end and it welded up nicely with our 105 amps. However when we started over here on this hole which was much larger down here at the bottom we had about three sixteenths gap and then right about the time we got up here this elbow shape around the corner ended up being almost three eighths of an inch. Um, required a lot more heat going up through here because we not only have this panel uh, on the other side of the crack was that panel and then this panel come right up to it. So a lot more aluminum in this area and it required more heat. After uh, starting, I quickly realized that I needed more power. I stopped and I went over and I turned the machine up to 135 amps. That allowed me to get more filler and more heat into this crevice. Um, however, ultimately it resulted in more filler bridging this inside corner joint instead of dumping into it deeply like I had hoped. So looking back over today's weld, if I would have gotten in the interior of the boat and started welding there where I had flush piece with a crack in the middle of it that I could have just started welding, it would have been exactly like how I practiced on the table. However, for some reason, I pushed my chair around here and I grabbed some filler rod and I seen the hole and I just started welding. Starting on the inside corner joint made it very difficult to get filler not only in the inside corner joint, but in the crack inside the inside corner joint, which resulted in excessive material and the finished product. Now, yes, I definitely could go back and blend it 
and wipe it down flush, you know, with a flap disc. Put another coat of paint on it. As you can see, my old janky boat's got lots of paint on it, but I'm not worried about that. The whole point was to stop the stress crack, show you how to clean and prepare the weld, and then make sure that it didn't leak anymore. And that's what we did. Now, the interior joint is a little bit more difficult than just fixing a crack on a flush vertical plate. So maybe you can do it better than I did when you have this issue. As always, check out all the stuff from weld.com, their website, their app, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and even right here on YouTube, you should subscribe and ring the bell. I'm your host, White River Rambo. Don't forget to wear the personal flotation devices, and I will see you on the next one.